Despite being midday, Lizzie's was already busy. That's just Night City for you. As I pulled into a parking spot I could see Rita the Bouncer throwing some drunk out of the club. The poor guy not able to fight back against the Borg woman who happily tossed him on his ass onto the asphalt. I walked up stepping over the groaning drunk as I headed up to the door only to be stopped by Rita as she sauntered into my path. Knox finally found you huh? She seemed to question her eyes locked on mine. Yeah, I had someone let me know he was trying to get in touch. I told her as I stopped, as the way she was looking told me she wasn't happy. We aren't the type to be pissed with avoiding someone you aren't interested in, but it's fucked not to at least let him down easy, she said with a little glare, telling me in no uncertain terms that my disappearance wasn't taken well. Geez what is it with these mocks? There was nothing like that. I was out of touch because of some maelstrom trouble. I was under a jammer. I didn't even know he was trying to contact me. She snorted a bit but stepped aside letting me in. Thankfully it seems she wasn't taking the matter into her own hands. I decided to ignore every Mox's weird assumptions and just get back to business. Side quest. I walked through the entrance without stopping at the desk. I wasn't here to buy BDs after all. Honestly BD stuff kinda creeped me out. The fact that you could feel other people's emotions during a BD, rather than your own? It was like. Art that forces a perspective on you. Which was sorta weird. Imagine watching a TV show, but instead of enjoying it from your own perspective, you felt the emotions of the main character, watched from their eyes. It was just weird. One of the reasons I hadn't done any brain dance stuff since I woke up in Night City, normal TV and games was good enough for me. No need to stick other people's emotions in my head. The main room was actually surprisingly full. Again the fact it was midday seemed to have no effect on Night City debauchery. But I didn't see Knox. So I did what any gun-toting merc does when you enter a bar. I walked up to the bartender and settled into a chair, waiting for him to finish an order before walking over. What can I get you? Just information. I'm looking for Knox, he asked me to meet him. Ask. That's right, you're that one girl. The bartender gave a chuckle as his eyes went yellow. I let him know, he'll be here in a minute. I shrugged, I could have sent a text too. So Mox tends to be defensive about the kids. Might be a good idea to let the kid down flat if you aren't interested instead of ghosting him. The man offered as he wiped a glass clean. Wait. I couldn't help but ask as I brought up my hand to the guy to stop him from saying anything further. Did Knox tell everyone that I ghosted him or something? You're the third Mox I've met today that mentioned that. Well less he told us, and more he has been Mopin. Thanks Mateo. Knox yelled as the boy practically jumped the bar to try and shut the bartender up. Hey Motoko. Glad you made it. Come on I have something preem to show you, he said glaring at the bartender who was smiling behind the teenager's hand as waved his hands in a go on then motion. Sure. I offered shrugging which grabbed Knox's attention. Whoa. That's fresh chrome. Double full armor replacement? He asked, looking curiously at my arms. Yeah. The reason no messages went through. I got kidnapped by Maelstrom. Ended up needing some ripper work done after. Been under a jammer for the bit. Sorry about that. I explained. Hopefully the explanation would stop making every mox I ran into tell me off for ignoring Knox. Seriously Susie didn't seem to be too happy with Knox, but considering everyone's reaction, he must be pretty loved by the mox. Damn. He muttered looking shocked as he took in my arms. But I wasn't about to get into it right now, especially with someone I wasn't super close to. So the gig? All right. Yeah come on it's this way. He offered slowly seeming to come to some conclusion as he finally slipped off the bar and waved me to follow. We went through the back down some halls until we came to a place I actually remembered. Down a set of dark steps into a server room. The room that carried all the Mox's BDs probably, considering they literally ran a BD club it made sense they would need a ton of storage, and processing. But this was the realm of a certain character. Jude's, Knox yelled out as he hurried forward rushing into the next room as I hesitated. I don't know if I was ready to meet Judy. I'd seen her naked. Well I mean, it was a video game but still. She was real here. How do you respond to someone that you've basically seen in a porn? I resisted slapping myself but only just, as I shook my head. Focus Motoko, I demanded as I let cool slip over. 
Then I walked into the room where Knox was standing next to Judy Alvarez. She was younger. It struck me then that Judy was pretty young in 2077. Right now, she practically looked like a teenager, or only just out of it. Motoko. This is Judy, she is absolutely novo at anything tech, but she is the best BD maestro in Night City. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Jude, this is Motoko, she backed me up before, didn't even try to cred me. She is running as an edge runner, and would be perfect for that idea I talked to you about. Yeah I remember Knox. Didn't she ghost you? Judy asked as she pulled up a BD wreath set and set it on the desk she was sitting at. And no. It wasn't like that. She got into some trouble that's all. Her arms weren't chrome before. He offered the end quietly, practically whispering it, but I picked it up without much trouble. Judy's eyes shifted to me, to my arms back to him, and I could just make out through a side profile that Knox was looking. Worried? Right moving on from that. Judy grabbed her wreath and sort of pointed it at me. You know anything about virtue? I blinked at the random question, I opened my mouth to answer then closed it. The word was familiar, and it was on the tip of my tongue. But Judy didn't wait. Virtues are raw BDs unedited. The bass recording. Then a BD editor like me goes through, fixes it up, gets rid of the dangerous highs, or the uncomfortable lows. Makes it usable for people. And Judy is the best. Knox offered with a grin as he sat back on the desk. But there are a lot of markets for BDs. Not just. Porn. He offered chuckling a little with a blush across his cheeks. Right. I get that. So what's the gig? Knox's idea. Wants to move into edge runner BDs. They are extremely popular, although usually, they are snuff films. Judy offered looking at me. Oh. Ooh. You want me to record BDs? Exactly. Knox offered rushing up to me practically bouncing on his feet. You were Nova when you 14 and his assholes. It gave me the idea see. What if we start putting out preem BDs of edge runners on gigs? With the best BD editor in Night City cleaning them up, we can offer the experience to people that they can't get outside of XBDs. Not that we expect you to do something crazy right away. Judy interrupted, waving her hands a bit as she tried to calm Knox down. We don't want you doing something crazy and flatlining, but whatever is normal is fine, the goal is to sort of. Judy trailed off as she rolled her wrist as she searched for the right word. My goal is to build up a catalogue, and brand. Right now there aren't really any BDs of edge runners working that isn't an XBD. The only BDs that come close are like Jimmy Kurosaki's edge runner, but those are all cyber psycho shit, Knox said, shaking his head as Judy nodded along. I guess the Mox had an issue with that sort of BD? I mean sure, sending out an edge runner to do gigs while we record is asking for some deaths. But I want to make a BD that a normal person can enjoy, a taste of, what it's like to be an edge runner. Knox said, speaking quickly and almost rambling, I could hear the excitement in his voice as he talked. So you want me? Of course. You're preem. You fight really well, you're a good person, and... Knox trailed off blushing a little as he tried to figure out what to say. You are good looking. Judy interrupted with a smirk causing Knox to jump and glare at her. You'd be surprised how many people enjoy a BD from the perspective of someone good looking. That. And the pay probably won't be great at first. Knox added, looking apologetic. It's gonna cost to get everything started. Shards to store it on, Judy's services, which aren't free. Hey I know I'm good and I already work all day doing this. I know I know. Knox offered hands up. Anyway, yeah. So the pay is gonna be shit? He said questioningly looking towards me. Ah oh, I see. The real reason behind choosing me. I'm a young edge runner, someone you know, and probably the only person that heard your deal and then heard the pay and didn't walk out, I said, smacking myself as Judy chuckled as she seemed to watch what was happening with no intention of getting involved. Knox on the other hand was going red in the face from embarrassment. I, Sure. Sounds fun. I interrupted as I looked around the place. So this is your setup. Preem, Judy very preem. I don't even recognize all of this stuff. Most of it is tweaked under the box, only the cases are standard. She offered with a grin as I seemed to ignore Knox's confusion as he looked around like the world wasn't on its right axle. You will? Sure. It's not like I don't already go out and take gigs. Making extra money on the side for some of them? 
Sounds like a good idea. Just as long as the eddies do end up in my pocket once everything has started. Deal. I promise you won't regret this. Cool. So what do I need to record a BD? I don't have the cyberware for that. Right. About that? Knox asked, once more wincing. Kids broke, and a good BD recorder is about 500 eddies. Judy interrupted with a flat response. I gave Knox a scowl that he looked like he desperately wanted to do something to fix before I sighed. I'll go talk to my ripper. You do that. Come around once you are chipped. Judy says waving from above her chair as the woman had put back on her BD wreath and was getting back to work. Thank you, Knox said as he sort of followed me as I decided to leave Judy to her work. Don't worry about it. Besides, it's smart. I turned on him suddenly poking my finger right into his face which had him freak as he backpedaled in retreat. I respect the entrepreneurial spirit. Honestly it's an over idea, something I can do, and it's extra eddies for something I'm already doing. But Knox, I like blunt honesty more than hype. Next time if you have an idea and there is a problem just talk to me. Then as he stood that mouth opening and closing trying to find the words I held out my hand. Partner? His mouth clicked shut and his spine straightened out. Partners. We shook hands and I gave him a firm nod. Now I'm off to my ripper. Oh. Mind if I come? Sure, I agreed. It would be nice to get to know Knox more anyways. Dash. Your taste in music is kinda bad. Knox told me as I puffed up my cheeks a bit. He reddened a bit too as his words finally seemed to reach his brain. Realizing he was being rude. Just because I thought the samurai songs were still cool. It wasn't my fault. He grew up in a world where they were old before he even was born. For me they were catchy new songs, and while Silverhand was a jackass, he was a talented jackass. I just like what I like. Right. He muttered, trying to awkwardly end the conversation he was kind of fidgeting which I could see out of the corner of my eye thanks to my wide vision. I let it go he didn't really feel like arguing my music preferences. Instead I found a parking spot in front of Misty's esoterica. Come on this is it. I told him as I slipped out of my car, watching as he looked around confused. I thought you said you were going to see a ripper? I am. I replied smiling as I stepped into Misty's shop and called out. Misty? Oh is that Motoko? Misty's voice called out from the back as her fluffy hair poked around the corner with the rest of her following as she stepped out I noticed the Buddhist statue she was carrying. I noticed she was struggling and instantly I was rushing up to her, easily grabbing the statue and lifting it out of her arms. Misty really needed to work out more, even before I got my arms, I could have lifted the statue. Oh, thank you Motoko. You're pretty strong huh? She asked, looking surprised as I lifted it up and I just shrugged. Cyber arms, and healthy exercise. I gave her a response with a big smile. Where does this go? Oh here, thank you. Oh and you have a friend? Welcome to Misty's Esoterica. She called out to Knox who was looking around with the same look Hiromi had on when I first brought her here. I was giggling as I placed the statue down in the place Misty wanted it. Is Vic in? He is. Watching the game from what I heard when I walked past the stairs. Are you okay? Misty asked suddenly as she seemed to appear in my personal space and place a hand on my shoulder. You don't seem to be in any pain anymore, but... I'm great Misty. Vic took perfect care of me, and I healed all up. I assured her with a smile, pulling up my leotard around my shoulder so she could see the connection of chrome and flesh. I let her poke her nose in for a moment before she nodded I don't see any injury. You healed quick. Yeah well. If I'm honest I was having a rough time of it at first, but I stopped trying to think of my arms as the same as my flesh ones. I realized I was different now, but my ghost can't be hurt with a little metal. I told her, even if it still wasn't 100%. I still had flashes of discomfort, not pain, but shoving heavy metal arms into my shoulders left me with plenty of little issues. But adaptation had helped so much, I felt incredible. More. Normal. Misty looked into my face for a moment before she nodded. I'm glad. If you need some spiritual guidance, I would be honored if you let me help in any way I can. I'm not Vic. I can't fix your body. But there are plenty of options to help fix your spirit. Or your ghost? I'm not familiar with that belief, Misty said but it was definitely a question. Shit did I say ghost? Oh fuck, what do I do? 
I can't be honest then I would have to admit I'm a fucking nerd. Like a super nerd. Ah eh, well, it's, I stuttered along before Misty seemed to get my discomfort and just sort of chuckled at me. No with me. I broke into a laugh along with her. I'll tell you about it sometime. It's kinda embarrassing. I look forward to it. Hearing about different beliefs is why I opened my shop, she said waving her arms a bit showing off the decor. So she isn't your ripper? No, Misty is just awesome. I told Knox as Misty laughed at my response before throwing me a wink. I sometimes work as Vic's nurse, but I'm not a ripper. Come on I'll walk you down. Misty offered, threading her arm with mine. I happily joined her laughing as we walked out the back and down the steps. Vic? You have customers. Misty called down which again made me think she was more than just a sometimes nurse. More like a nurse, assistant, and secretary all in one. Well plus his landlord, as if I remembered right, she was the owner of the little basement storage that Vic used. Knox was frowning in the same way Hiromi did as he followed us down. Vic, we need to talk about your aesthetics. I couldn't help but joke in my head as the gate was unlocked and Vic saw me. Motoko. Glad to see you up and about, how are the arms, any weakness, flashing pains? Come sit, I'll take a look. He offered instantly swiveling his chair to his ripper seat as he waved me forward. Could I admit that I absolutely loved these two? Vic was total dad energy, and Misty was total big sister energy. That's it. I'm adopting them both. I barked out a laugh to my own thoughts confusing everyone, but I didn't care. I happily walked over and plopped in the chair. Vic, Knox, no Knox I refuse to introduce you using your tagline. I offered at the boy's pout but to my distress he interrupted. Knox the Mox. He threw a wink at Misty Witch. He was cruising for a bruising flirting with Jackie's girl. Well soon to be girl I am pretty sure they weren't dating yet, at least I hadn't seen him. That just meant I would have to protect her for him then. Jackie Misty OTP. Hmm. That's odd. Vic muttered beside me, and I realized he was checking my shoulder. Fuck of course he would notice how fast I healed. Hey Misty, can you do me a favor? Take Knox upstairs for a few minutes? I asked with an apologetic smile, and the boy despite being a teenager seemed to realize that I was asking her to get him out of here for a bit. Misty nodded once sharply. Course. Come on Knox, have you ever had your fortune read? Um, no. But it could be fun? That's the spirit. Misty offered with a grin as they headed up. Vic though hadn't been looking at the byplay, no he was already grabbing multiple other tools and taking a look at my shoulder very closely. Finally he pulled his face from the little pad he had his nose buried in, as his other hand pushed a weird probe against my shoulder scanning it. Motoko. How are you completely healed? There isn't even any scar tissue left. He asked, his hand on the probe still. I opened my mouth to answer then closed it. I had kinda thought I would eventually be asked about all my weirdness, I just hadn't even thought about it this time. But of course Vic would notice, I could have come back in six months, and he likely still would have noticed something was weird. Fast heal, or other drugs don't heal like this, completely. I would swear if asked that you were born with this chrome. Which is impossible. I opened my mouth again, to say something to come up with some answer that would make sense. I just didn't have one. Instant healing. No instant perfect healing. There wasn't anything quite like it. I know it's weird, but I can't really explain it. I decided instead. I just. Didn't want to lie to him. Vic was a good person, had done me a serious favor when he fixed up my arms. He sat back a bit looking me over as he ran his hand over his cheeks and chin. I noticed it was not the hand covered in ripper gear. You in any danger kid? No. I uh. I'm safe Vic. No one knows I can heal fast. I even kept it from June. I uh. When I woke up from a coma. A year long coma, I was able to walk again in like a week. I told him and I watched his eyebrows come together in shock. Impossible. I heal fast. I can basically fully recover from just about anything with a full night's rest. Eight hours of sleep, and pop, I'm good to go. Fuck he whispered, causing me to giggle as he realized what he had said. Shit. No wait. Sorry. Sorry kid. Okay you can't tell me how? I know how. But I really can't talk about it. I trust you Vic, don't think I don't, I mean, 
You're basically my full-time doctor now, but I just can't really explain it. Healing at this level? Hell kid that would put me out of a job, in a good way. You can't tell me anything? It's not transferable, and there isn't any way to copy it as far as I know. I offered, actually sad at the idea. I hadn't really considered how useful gamer healing could be, but Vic had instantly gone to other people, about how this could help them. I really wasn't a hero I guess. Alright. He took a deep breath and shook it off. If you want me to be your ripper, I'm gonna need to know what this is. Maybe an overnight after an injury so I can get some scans, or figure out what is happening, it makes me nervous to do anything if I don't know how the healing process will be. Okay. I told him which must have surprised him at my easy agreement. I trust you. I answered by giving him a thumbs up. So yeah. That's my big secret. I heal fast, that's one of the reasons why I'm not afraid to work as a merc. Well kid, for a secret, it's a hell of a big one. Alright. Alright. Enough of this, your shoulder looks great. And you obviously came here for something? BD recorder, I said laughing at Vic's surprised look before he flushed. Literally the guy went fully red. Kid. I guess you might be getting a good deal with the mocks, but maybe. Is that kind of work really what you, Vic, my friend, doctor, and someone I respect, before you embarrass yourself anymore? The idea is to record while I'm on gigs for a sort of softcore XPG release. Killing and doing merc work, not normal mox stuff. Oh thank Christ. He exhaled practically whooping as the air rushed out of him, but that was completely muffled by my absolute giggle fit. Oh also. Can you check my arms? I got a bit dinged up by some maelstrom the other night, and my right arm has this hitch when I try to. Yeah kid, shush, I'll take care of it. Giving me a heart attack. He grumbled but he was hiding a smirk. I matched him. It was nice. To be able to just. Reveal the truth. Thanks Vic, I whispered, feeling my eyes water a little as he took care of me. Total dad energy. It was a very fast procedure for Vic to install a BD recorder. I already had my Kiroshi, so I really only needed the small nodule that was added to my neural link. You couldn't even notice as it was just a few moments work to pop open the back of my neck where my cable ports were install the squarish box that was software in storage for the recordings, and then close me back up. I think the arm was even faster, he popped me open, and just did some magic with a few tools, and the dent was fine. I didn't even need anesthesia. It was more hardware installation, than surgery. All right left and right? No twinge? No points where your neck feels like it grinds on anything? Good. All set then. Vic says as he takes his hands off the side of my neck where he was guiding my head. I checked out the BD recorder myself, so I trust there isn't anything hidden on it, which is a serious concern. I've seen far too many people come in, after being blackmailed when someone gave them a recorder with a back door. Just make sure you keep it turned off when you don't want it on. Got it. Thanks Vic. For everything. Don't look at me like that, with those puppy dog eyes. You're a good kid. Stay alive. I will. I can't die until I get older than you. I tease as I hop off the chair, earning a deep chuckle from the man. Well at least I know it will be years down the line then. Go on, I bet Misty is torturing your mock's friend. Yeah, she is pretty preem like that, I said as I walked up the stairs, my waving hand the last thing Vic could see as I walked up and into Misty's. So what does that mean? I heard as I turned the corner. Knox was sitting over an array of tarot cards Misty had laid out. I told you, what it means changes depending on you. But the tarot can help guide your way, open a path. I hope it helps. I still have no idea what it means. It means you should listen to Misty. I offered surprising both of them, I guess I had been too quiet. Oh Motoko, everything okay? Yep. Vic and I just needed a talk, I'm all set and chipped with a BD recorder. I tell the two earning a jerk from Misty. BD recorder? I had to bite back a giggle as Misty reacted just like Vic. Don't worry, nothing weird. I'm working with Nox and the Mox, doing BDs of my Merc work. Like softcore XBDs. I explain earning a wrinkled nose at my words but eventually she nodded. You'll be safe? Course. All it means is that I'll have a chance to make more eddies for each gig I do, I said as I jerked my head at Nox. You ready to go? Judy needed to set up some stuff first right? Yeah. Awesome. 
Jude's gonna be shocked you got chipped so fast. Thanks for ah, uh, paying for it. Don't worry about it, everything after this is the easy part for me, I'm just gonna do my normal jobs, you're the one who has to sell them. I say, laughing even though he was looking at me like I was crazy. Why did everyone always look at me like that? Dash. Back already? Judy's voice called out as we walked down into her little lab. Yep. Jude, Motoko got chipped. You ready? Sure sure. The girl said digging a shard out of her desk and pushing it into her computer before running a program. My eyes caught the shifting text as she typed, and I realized she was setting up a program for a BD recorder. I walked up as she worked, and while I wasn't perfect I was able to follow along with the program. It made me relax a bit realizing it was mostly about how much data on what to store. You don't like the BD recorder's standard settings? Nope, they are slop, we've been making so many BDs we've designed our own adjustments. You don't mind? She asked not looking away from the computer as she worked. I'm not seeing anything that can activate the recorder when I don't want it on. Mostly just sensitivity settings for emotions, and increased bandwidth for my vision? About right. Standard BD virtues aren't meant for high quality optics like those Kiroshi. They can let me increase the quality a good bit, will let me pick out more interesting things on the virtue as I edit it. Cool, I whispered, earning a snort from the older girl. You sound like my grandmother, she said suddenly, actually looking at me with a half smile. Nobody says cool anymore. I do. It's kinda. Lame. I'm bringing it back. I argued instantly, how could anyone think cool wasn't cool slang? It was cool. Judy actually broke into a husky laugh then both arms holding her stomach as she chortled almost crying as I pouted at her. Oh Chum, that's funny. She finally managed to stop laughing long enough to say as she went back to typing just with little giggles breaking in now and then. I pouted harder as I turned to Knox who was pointedly not looking at me. Oh it's on. I'm now making it a duty to say cool at least once on every one of these stupid BD recordings, just to prove it wasn't lame. Take that. Here. Judy finally said throwing the shard at me, and I slotted it, I did run a double check that there was nothing malicious. I was fairly certain Judy wouldn't pull a fast one, but it was just good ideas to check random software. It looked fine to everything I could see, and I let it update my BD recorder's settings. Preem. So next time I take a gig I'll turn on the recording and bring you the virtue? You got it. Raw BDs are virtues. Judy confirmed, before she suddenly shooed me away. Now both of you get out of here, I still have a lot of work to do, Knox take your output upstairs have some fun or something. Motoko isn't my output. Judy. Ha 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 ha. She cackled ignoring Knox's frantic denials. Or she was teasing him. That's cute. I'm here? Knox offered me as he settled a drink onto the table in front of me. He had led me up and offered a seat then ran off to grab a drink. Thankfully I had made sure to mention I don't drink alcohol. So I had a can of some lemony soda. Thanks, I agreed as I popped the tab. It's pretty impressive, coming up with the idea of edge runner BDs. Oh well. I've always wanted to sell my own BDs, you know? I came up with the idea after selling an XBD to a guy, he ended up showing up the next day. He had puked his guts out, asked if there was anything action he liked that with just less. Cyber Psycho? Exactly. Edge runners are super popular you know? Everyone can talk about Black Hand, or Rogue. But not many can actually experience that. So I thought about trying to find an edge runner, to talk about my idea with. I was trying to find someone just you know as a side thing when I ran into you. And you decided to ask me after seeing me have a fist fight with a couple kids. When I didn't win? Plesian's actually pretty nasty hand to hand, there is a reason I was on the ground, but I mean. You're my age, already a merc. You walk the walk, talk the talk. It made me realize I don't need to start at the top. Plus you're my age, do you have any idea how many kids our age want to be an edge runner? To experience life as a merc even second hand? From someone their own age? That'll be a rush. I can see it, I agreed taking a sip from my drink. So I guess it's in my corner now. I'll need to find a gig, or just go out and find some trouble to record. My words made Knox wince a bit. Sorry. To put everything in your lap. It's fine. Like I said, this is a good idea. It could be fun, I've never been a movie star before. 
BD star? No, that kinda has certain connotations. I muttered causing Knox to snort into his drink. BD stars are a thing too. Of the non-porn style. He offered and I chuckled nodding. There was a big BD studio here in the city too. That's where they did that fucking crucifixion questline. Right. Night City was fucked up. All right. I suppose I should get to work then. I'll reach out to Wakako and see if she has anything. Or I could go hunt some maelstrom. Knox winced at that and quickly put his drink down. Maybe something less. Dangerous? A. Maelstrom are pretty easy. Most of the time their guys are watching TV, or mid BD. It's super easy to kill someone when they are in the middle of a BD. I say making the motion of slicing their throat that at this point was practically wrote to me. All right. That easy? Oh sure. They are so distracted they never notice. Scavs are that way too. Always a couple in the middle of some BD relaxing while the others work. The first time I went into a scav nest I killed two of them that way. I offer making sure not to mention it wasn't just my first scav nest, but my only one. Didn't want him to think I was some noob or something. Seriously, only one scav den? That was pretty noobish I think. Rookie numbers Motoko. Knox just sort of nodded along with me as I explained how easy it was murder someone in the middle of a BD. Dash. Leaving Knox at Lizzie's after we hung out for a while, I decided I might as well see what was going on with Wakako. I hadn't heard from her since the whole kidnapping thing. Which surprised me, I expected her to reach out at some point for a job. So I drove home. Driving down the street next to the apartment I looked around as I slowly rolled down the road. It was quiet. The old man that usually ran the food cart next to the entrance of the apartment was gone. The streets were. Quiet. It made me sad. I actually kind of liked the density of Night City, to be able to just walk amongst a horde of people. I kept going. I wasn't going to stop at the apartment. I was here to see Wakako. I drove down and parked on the street outside Jig Jig Street. As I walked through the darkened area I couldn't help but chuff out a laugh. A gang war going on. The normally full streets practically empty and nearly barren. Jig Jig Street? As busy as ever. Shaking my head I walked past the dolls that were still offering services, past the johns that were flirting and paying for services, past the people that wanted to different stalls buying and selling. I noticed plenty of guards hanging around. My Kiroshi punching through the dark corners between the shops seeing men in suits, or just gangsters hanging around keeping an eye out. I guess Wakako was well protected. I entered her pachinko parlor, again wondering about her choice of venue. Get in here girl. Stop wasting my time. Wakako called out as I walked in, as usual not waiting for me to check if she was free. The woman as usual was sitting back in her chair cigarette smoke haloing her as her TV ran some ancient broadcast of a show that was probably coming out when I would have been alive in my last life. Long time no see Wakako. How are you? I said not sure what else to say. She of course wasn't enthused about my greeting. Sit down girl. I'm not pleased with you. Joining the kamikaze? Foolish, a waste of your ability. I pay more. I opened my mouth closed it. Frowned, then rose a finger. I didn't though? An elegant eyebrow rose up, and a moment later her eyes turned gold. A text was sent with a picture. Oh, it was a picture of me standing with June after the assault we did on the Maelstrom Armory. I hold off on sending you any jobs after your unfortunate assault. Giving you time to recover and then you join up with those fools? I didn't join them, not really, the one next to me is June my brother. He was being all over protective after the kidnapping, so I went on that raid to prove I could handle myself. It didn't really work, but I ran out after and hit another maelstrom group on my own, and June. You don't care? No. Right, I'm not a part of Kamikaze. Terrible name by the way. She hummed a little as her sharp eyes kept locked on mine, but I wasn't about to flinch, I was telling her the truth. Besides she was dangerous in a way, but I think she was actually pretty nice when you get past all the necessary harshness of living in Night City. Fine. Her eyes went gold again and I blinked as she sent me like three different messages. I've been forced to hold on to these gigs for longer than I would have liked. Complete them. I blinked looking at the three different gigs she had sent me reading through them quickly, all of them were pretty much the same. Go to a place, steal something bring it to Wakako. Easy really, 
but there was a complication. If that's all, she dismissed me, but I didn't get up. Question. Her narrowed eyes prompted me to quickly get on with it. I've picked up a side gig, I'm recording my gigs for BD release through the mocks. I just want to make sure none of them are sensitive, and a BD of me doing this won't cause trouble for the client. Or you. My question actually surprised her. Her face didn't shift, her body didn't move, she gave nothing away. But the fact she didn't have an instant answer like always told me a lot. Finally she nodded. Foolish, but I don't argue with fools. A week. Don't release the recordings for a week. For these three gigs. You will ask before recording any gig I give you in the future. Will do. I offered flashing a smile, and ignoring her remarks about me being a fool. It wasn't about being smart or stupid. It was about doing something cool. I stood then wandering back out into Jig Jig Street. I guess I had some jobs to do? Dash. The first job was childishly easy. Mega Building H1 looked just like all the mega buildings, just more run down since it was the oldest. I headed up to floor 15, found the correct apartment number, and unlocked the door with practically a glance. The standard security system on the door, was as useless as a door with a key sticking out of it. I walked in, boots utterly silent as I walked past the guy in the middle of enjoying a BD on his couch, walked over to his computer, grabbed the shard that was sticking out of the side of it, confirmed it was the right one with the verification program Wakako have given me and walked back out. Gig complete. Poor security made it child's play. I did record the whole thing but I doubt anyone would get any enjoyment out of it. It only lasted like 30 seconds. Then I moved on. Next job was in 6th Saint Territory. A guy was hiding out there, in a gang house, paying 6th Street to keep him safe. I wasn't there to kill him though. Wakako's gig workup explained some bare bones. Guy had blackmail on his boss, boss wanted the blackmail taken care of. So my job was to find the information, ensure it was recovered. Normally it would be deleted but Wakako wanted the data. Not my business. I pulled over a block away. The gang house was in a suburban area of rundown homes. I walked down the next street over. It wasn't hard to check a map and find the number of the house directly behind the gang house. Once I found it I simply walked right through the small gated backyard. It wasn't like people had dogs anymore. I still did that, realizing that was true. I really wanted to pet a puppy. I shook it off. Work now, sad realization later. I climbed the fence only after looking over it and making sure no one was hanging out in the back or had a camera set up. Nothing, I climbed over the fence in seconds drawing on my inner Jackie Chan, smiling as I managed to climb the fence just like he would as I went completely cold and hurried to the house. Mission recommended complete stealth. Apparently the boss wanted the guy trying to blackmail him to be alive to realize his plan fell through. Honestly I didn't know who was the good guy here. Was the boss cruel? Evil? Was his worker trying to steal money that didn't belong to him? I had no idea. Nor did I really care. I wasn't a hero. I slipped in through the back door noticing the living room to my right was occupied, a TV going and a few people talking to each other making fun of the show. I walked past the open door without them noticing, heading for the upstairs. I was halfway up the stairs when I felt it. That shiver up my spine. Danger sense. I leapt off the stairs landing without even a scrape on the tiled floor as I slipped into a closet at the foot of the stairs. The steps coming down the stairs I tracked with my ears as a new voice joined the two in the living room. I slipped out. Continued on my path up the stairs. Two doors, I checked one, looking under the door jam, nothing I could see or hear, I stood and just barely opened the door. Empty room. I slipped inside. Looking to see if my target was inside. The bedroom was a wreck, I instantly realized it wasn't the right one. This room was well lived in. My target had only just started staying with them. I checked the hall and slipped out, moving to the next room, I slipped inside once I checked it. Empty. But this one had the marks of someone having moved stuff around just recently. The computer on the desk was new. No dust, no lucky shards sticking in this time, but that was fine, I pulled out the cord from my neck and plugged it in. Eyes. I blinked as the system resisted, desperate to keep me out. It actually gave me some difficulty. The ice on this laptop was a bit more powerful than the defenses of a vending machine. 
Hellas was tougher than the security system the Netrunner Maelstrom had. I frowned as I found myself actually needing to fight against it. I could keep it from sending any sort of alert, as it was just a mindless system not backed up by a Netrunner defending it, but it was still tough. Where the hell had this guy even found this level of ice? I frowned realizing I might actually take some time to get through this. It seems the reason this guy managed to steal this info from his boss was probably because of his net running skill. Hmm. I could steal a computer, but without breaching in, I had no way to know if there was a backup. So I looked away for a moment and prepared myself in case I needed to delta. Window open, path free, and the computer unhooked from a power supply, and ready to be snatched and grabbed. Then I refocused on the digital defenses and got to work. Security code blasted through my vision as I breached and breached, each wall of ice seemingly more dense than the last, over and over, I broke through. I could see the alerts for both breach and intelligence flowing through, as I fought against the defense. Damn, if I had known how much experience I could get from something like this, I would have bought a ice program myself just to break it. Still I kept focused even as minutes passed, as the noise from downstairs continued. I just had to hope they were occupied. Finally something changed. Breach protocol skill level up. I felt the inrush of instincts and knowledge, and my work went even faster. Tricks the ice threw up that stymied me, now only slowed me for a moment, as my mind worked through problem after problem. Intelligence leveled up. The alert came in, intelligence 5, and if I was doing anything else I wouldn't have noticed change. But this time I did. Considering I was literally solving difficult equations, puzzles, and general issues the ice was programmed to throw up. But with intelligence, came clarity, came simplicity. The speed of me facing a new problem, and then putting forth the correct solution increased. Less wondering, less confusion, less brute force. I blinked. The computer was displaying its desktop. I was in. Seconds later I had confirmation. The file I was looking for was there, and it hadn't been copied, at least according to the metadata. Target acquired. I closed the laptop down, and used my already prepared getaway. I was out the window, landing in the backyard, and across the short fenced off area in moments. Then I was on the other street, and more than capable of just walking casually to my car.